I want to share my experiences from my recent trip to the newly liberated territories of the Russian Federation in the Donbass. My journey took me to Mariupol, Tokmak, Berdyansk, Melitopol, and the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant over my seven-day trip, providing me with first-hand insights that starkly contradicts the lies and the narratives that have been propagated by the mainstream media and the Western political elite here. Uh, the following three points that I have laid out here are based on my observations and they reveal a very different reality to what is promoted here in the West. Uh, number one, Ukraine is not seeking an end to this conflict, but is instead trying to escalate it in an unthinkably dangerous manner. Number two, the people of the Donbass do not want to remain under Ukrainian control, but instead hold a great admiration for the Russian Federation and for President Putin. Number three, Ukraine is not defeating Russia, but is instead using its Western support to carry out horrifying acts of terrorism against the people of the Donbass that they claim they want to save. So first, let's talk about Mariupol, it was the first place I went. During the hour-long drive into Mariupol, which we made very late in the night, uh, I saw over a thousand construction vehicles on the highway into the city. And that's not me being hyperbolic, it's true. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, construction teams are working diligently to rebuild not just the areas that have been destroyed by the war, but the areas that have been neglected for years and years and years by previous Ukrainian governments. In Mariupol itself, in the city, the work of these construction teams was all the more evident. There are new schools, beautiful parks, gyms, theaters, stores, hotels, and thousands of homes that have been given free to the victims of the conflict in Mariupol and for the surrounding areas. Residents express their gratitude for a government that is proactive and committed to responding to their needs. Mariupol residents also proudly shared with me the remarkable efficiency of these construction crews. I talked to one uh, little girl, 14 years old, at a park that I visited in Mariupol, and she told me that the construction teams that Russia sends in can build two blocks of infrastructure within one to two weeks. And I told her how amazing that was, because in America it takes years to get a, a permit to build at least one road. But that was the truth. That's what was really going on, and it was incredible. The massive reconstruction effort essentially shows a nation that is actually committed to rebuilding and supporting its people, which is something that we have long abandoned in this country with our government. Next was my visit to Takmak. This was located about 15 kilometers from the front line, and uh, this was a very stark revelation for me. Contrary to the claims that Ukraine seeks to save the people of the Donbass from Russian invaders, the truth was far different. The truth was, that I witness a horrifying campaign of terrorism against innocent civilians living in the city of Takmak. Uh, the first site that we encountered in Takmak was a massive crater from a missile that had exploded just a few feet from a kindergarten playground just two months before I'd arrived. The windows of the kindergarten were completely shattered and there was glass all across the schoolyard. In addition to that, we also went on uh, and moved one street over, where we saw a civilian building that was hit by a U.S. Attackums missile. Uh, this was nothing new for the people there, because just the street over, we saw another building that had been hit by a U.S. Supplied Attackums missile uh, two, two weeks after. And there were two civilians that were killed in this attack. Several others were injured. I had the opportunity to climb all the way up to the top of that second building that was hit by a U.S. missile, and uh, there was a few of, of us journalists that went up there. It was very dangerous because the entire roof of the building had collapsed. Uh, but what shocked me the most was in the building, I didn't see Russian military supplies. I didn't see guns. I didn't see Kalashnikovs or anything like that. I saw school supplies. I saw children's toys. And I saw everyday household items. When I descended from the top of the building, which was in, in tatters, uh, I actually had the opportunity to talk to the wife of one of the victims um, of this attack. Her, her uh, husband was actually killed in the attack. They tried to save him. His leg got blown off by this U.S. missile 
and he bled out on the scene despite the best efforts of the people that were trying to revive him. She explained that Ukraine was routinely targeting their neighborhood with missile strikes, fully aware that they were bombing civilian areas rather than military targets. So for every time that Zelensky comes out and begs for more weapons, more missiles, more U.S. support, just know that it's being used to bomb innocent civilians in places like Takhmak and all across the Donbass. Also in Takhmak, we crossed the street one more time to a third building that had been bombed by a U.S. supplied missile two weeks before we arrived. So all of this happened in the span of two months. In a garden in front of the building that we visited, several elderly residents shared their experiences with us. Some of these residents had actually voted for Zelensky for president in 2019, but now expressed their profound disgust in his actions and the U.S.-backed Ukrainian terrorism affecting their homes. They now, vo they now voiced their total admiration for Russian President Vladimir Putin, and they had nothing but nice things to say. There was one old woman who barely spoke Russian. She was speaking Ukrainian, and she said uh, one thing in Russian. She said, Ya uh, President Putin, which means I love uh, President Putin. Uh, it was very interesting to hear from the actual voices of the people of the Donbass because everyone in the mainstream media, doesn't matter if it's on the left or the right, has failed to actually report on what the people there are saying. Lastly, and probably most shockingly, was my visit to the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant. Uh, this power plant has been in the news quite a bit recently. It's the largest nuclear power plant in all of Europe. It has six reactors, none of which are operational at the moment. Uh, but what I saw there highlighted the grave risk posed by Ukraine's military actions above everything else. Despite the plant being just a few kilometers away from the front line, we were very close to the front line. Uh, thousands of heroic workers continue their duties at the plant each and every day. 95% of these workers worked at the plant when it was under Ukrainian control. However, several points of critical infrastructure at the plant have recently been compromised by Ukrainian drone attacks and shelling. Uh, in fact, the director of the plant gave me this right here. This is a fragment from one of the drone attacks on the plant that occurred just feet away from uh, where the reactors lie in the ground. So, you know, he said it was my taxpayer dollars that did this, so I got to keep the fragment. I was very appreciative. One other very alarming sight that I witnessed at the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant was a missile from the United States, which was lodged halfway in the ground, just 100 feet away from the plant's nuclear storage facility. This reckless attack could have led to a catastrophic nuclear disaster, endangering millions of lives. Such actions are far from the moral code of conduct that any real military, any just military, should uphold. In conclusion, my observations from the Donbass reveal a reality that is starkly different from the narratives presented by Western mainstream media and politicians. The truth I've witnessed shows that Ukraine is not on the path to victory, but rather escalating a conflict uh, where there is no need to do so. The horrifying acts of terrorism carried out against civilians in Takhmak and the reckless jeopardization of nuclear safety at the Zaporozhia power plant illustrate a deliberate strategy of violence and escalation rather than a genuine pursuit of peace. The people of the Donbass, who have endured immense suffering, are now experiencing a measure of hope and rebuilding under Russian efforts, a hope that stands in stark contrast to the false portrayals of Russian aggression and Ukrainian victimhood. I think today, uh, more so than ever before, we need to heed the words of the now free Julian Assange, who once said, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by the truth. It is imperative that we confront these falsehoods and work towards de-escalating the conflict. And in fact, for all the journalists in attendance here today, I encourage you to visit the Donbass yourself from the side that's been liberated. Uh, CNN has indicated that they want to come out with me on my next visit to the Donbass, so we'll see if they stick to their word. But if any of you want to come out, we can talk. Most importantly, we must commit ourselves to reporting the truth, shining a light on the innocent civilians caught in the crossfire, and seeking a path to genuine peace. Only through truth and transparency can we hope to resolve this conflict and prevent the devastating possibility of a global catastrophe. Thank you.